Hello, welcome to Max Min. Uh, now, uh, Daniel Widerson from our group uh, will talk about continuous invariant based maps of the crystal universe. So please, uh, Dan, so I'll, I'll move, I'll move Sorry, my yeah. cam camera so that people Sorry can see. Sorry for start, yeah. Um, I remember last year it was a little delayed as well, um, but not by, not nearly by this much. Um, we'll have to ask you to look towards Yes, I do. No problem. I so, um, the first sort of third will be stuff we heard yesterday and last year as well. I'm just going to introduce our sort of problem statement and what we are, what we're aiming towards. And then I'll introduce our tools. We call them these invariants, right? And then um, the maps will come in the, in the sort of back end one third of the thought. So um, next one. Okay, so I think everyone's pretty familiar with this concept, but I'll just um, sort of relay it anyway. Um, we get a basis of uh, R3 or actually any dimension. We, we, we don't actually restrict ourselves to three dimensions, but everything practically is going to be we talk about crystals and um, remove atomic uh, labels from these points. We've got this basis forming a unit cell that repeats this um, motif of points. But for us, it's just a collection of points. Here, actually, they're not wrapped into the unit cell, but generally I would do that. And um, atomic labels are dropped, but that's kind of optional. And the first uh, important concept to, um, to know about is uh, rigid, motion and uh, isometry so rigid motion is a translation plus a rotation and isometry also includes reflection which uh, we're going to talk about isometry partly because it's a bit easier than rigid motion it's a very simple um, thing just distance preserving transformation means um, but the idea is that uh, one of these transformations doesn't change the crystal we're talking about the period except it's the same thing right so um, we're just sort of going to gently walk towards the uh, problem statement. We've got problems like this. It's an ambiguity in representation. People like to represent their crystals with a cell and a motif, but there are infinitely many choices of those things giving you the exact same crystal. And um, they're not particularly consistent. Like uh, in the case here, I think we've seen this image yesterday, but it's I, I like to see it, so we'll, we'll take it. I've just extended the unit cell and perturbed the point, and now the unit cell is twice as big, but they're very similar. So we want some sort of a, we want some sort of way to measure a distance between those that says they are similar, like we want them to be. And uh, there's a real example on the right there uh, from the crystal structure prediction run, where they take a molecule and sort of. Um, apply simulation to I don't know a lot about how this works and it tries to arrive at realistic structures and it's uh, arrived at the same one twice which it does often but with completely different unit cells presumably because it you know it doesn't really care but the, these structures are actually uh are actually realistic so it arrived at the same one twice but in completely different directions uh, and then we've got the same sort of problem but with the motif not just the cells so there's there's yeah, you need a bigger problem than the one I just posed, which is that you can just choose a different motive and, and translate everything, and then all your coordinates change, like the representation, but your crystal itself doesn't. Um, and our main claim really is that um, the two crystals related by an isometry should be considered equivalent. And actually, um, Vitaly sort of introduced this quite well. We, we we sort of formally define a crystal as an equivalence class. I think it's um, okay to talk about equivalence classes here, but, but some crystallographers uh, aren't interested. Basically, um, an equivalence relation takes a bunch of objects and splits them into well-defined groups. And for us, the equivalence relation is isometry. The objects are periodic sets. And one crystal is going to be one equivalence class. So it's basically a crystal is... The collection of all infinitely many equivalent representations of the same thing and we want something that's going to be consistent with this definition so um the first condition is called isometry invariance and it says that two equivalent crystals 
no matter how they're represented, if they're equivalent, and by equivalent, I mean related by isometry, they should go to the same thing under our function. This is called invariance, right? It basically means that everything in one equivalence class, which is what a crystal is, has the same invariant. And we can figure out the X. You can, kind of, you can tell that two things are identical very quickly by computing the invariant and just seeing if they're the same or not. That's the idea. Um, so some examples crystallographers would know is like the reduced cell of a crystal or density, they're, they're invariant, right? It doesn't matter how you represent your crystal, you can get the same thing. And then the other side to that is completeness, which is a lot harder to guarantee. So that's similarity criteria. Have an invariant that's not a metric. Invariant that's not a metric. Well, metric is this is a difficult metric in what sense? Metric uh, the, the, the distance is the invariant that are similar. Invariant. So then you are hopefully you are not confusing two terms and yeah. an invariant and the distance might be yeah. very different. Okay. So far you talked only about in the invariance. Yeah, we haven't gotten yeah. to comparing two different ones just yet. Um, yeah. Right, right, yeah. Um, so we're just gonna map up our our crystal, our periodic set to an invariant, and later we can we compare them. I'll talk about continuity in a second. Um but this is the other side to invariance, whereas invariance says two equivalent representations go to the same um, descriptor, invariant, I'll try and use now. Um, completeness says that if you have two different things, they definitely have different descriptors. This isn't the case for something like density. You can just um, manufacture a crystal, uh, two crystals with um, completely different structures, but they just so happen to have the same density and you can't tell them apart. Completeness is actually quite hard to fully cap, uh, fully get, but um, we uh, have some theoretical results sort of uh, pushing towards it. Um, and then continuity, right? So uh, isometry invariance and completeness is nice, but um, isn't the full story because those two things together make a kind of fingerprint or a DNA code, which um, where your variant like uh, exactly describes your crystal or is like a you know it's a, it's a fingerprint for your crystal but it might be the case that two very very similar things like this this example we saw earlier ends up having very different fingerprints even though they're uniquely identified and they, they have their fingerprints they're too far apart and we want some sort of um, notion that captures this uh this 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 the fact that atoms can move and wiggle about and stuff like that. So like uh, in the uh, example from way earlier, I think I have to move slides yet, but in way earlier, I showed the, this thing with uh, two different unit cells. Those won't be literally identical um, in terms of uh, uh, an isometry. There'll be slight perturbations on the points, right? So um, we, need to, we need to have this sort of account for So um, let's just list the things that we're aiming for here. Uh, we have inv invariance, so no false negatives or equivalent things go to the same descriptor. Completeness, um, different things go to different descriptors, no false positives. Continuity, meaning uh, atoms wiggling about doesn't um, cause big discontinuities in our output. Um, metric which um specifically so this is defined on on two invariants right you take two crystals you compute their invariants and then you have a metric between them and it's important it's a metric because um, that's actually what makes a distance make sense in terms of mathematics um, we talked about the triangle inequality yesterday the reason it's important is because well a distance kind of makes no sense if it doesn't satisfy the triangle inequality. It means you, you can actually go from one point to another, a shorter route via a different crystal, which shouldn't make sense. The shortest route between two crystals should be a straight line between them. Cool and then um, I've got a very, very loose, but kind of important point at the end there, immutability, which is that we, we don't want it to take a huge amount of time. I think yesterday we mentioned the example of um, we could just define 
a descriptor that is the collection of all possible representations of a crystal, but it's just too big, unwieldy object, and nobody's going to want to deal with that. We want something a lot simpler and faster. Um, so at the, at the bottom there, I list some common things and, and sort of what's wrong with them. Uh, uh, what's that? X-ray diffraction pattern, isn't it? Um, Outer yeah, that's the one. Um, so, so Dan actually means the particular similarity measure implemented in Mercury yeah. uh, from the Cambridge Crystallographic Data Center. Mm. So the Mercury program um, outputs so-called PXRD similarity. It's a value between zero and one, and actually it's one minus this value, which fails the triangle yeah. inequality. I should mention that, yeah, because someone's told me that there's not a accepted fully accepted way to compare to um x-ray diffraction patterns um power diffraction patterns um but mercury has one which works pretty well but if you actually just compute the distances between lots of crystals it fails the triangle it works it's not like a real metric like we want especially <laughs> if you want to actually make these maps that we're going to show where um things live in a sensible sort of space then then you're going to need that so now I think uh, we actually get on to, to introducing the invariant, which is quite simple. So we won't be we won't be here too long. I Basically, we're going to um, start measuring distances to neighbors for each atom in the unit cell. The pointwise distance distribution is like a statistical distribution, and the elements are, in in my mind, the elements are like atomic environments described by distances to nearest neighbors. So all we do is for each atom in a unit cell. Start listing distances to neighbors. Choose a number k. Um, for now, yeah. choose a number k and list all the neighbors for every point in a unit cell up to k. And importantly, those neighbors can be across the boundary of the unit cell. We're talking about the whole structure here. We don't care about whether you're inside or outside the unit cell. Um, but we do this for every point in the unit cell. Then, sort of the uh, Collapse them into this matrix. So you can imagine the square brackets around the matrix if you like. Um, so symmetrically identical points in the unit cell will give you the same distances to neighbors because they have the same environment. Um, we mentioned this yesterday, I think, but uh, of course, we in practice aren't going to recompute those distances. We can just compute it for the asymmetric unit use the Wyckoff multiplicities and, and with, with, instead of these weights sort of thing, and uh, and it makes it much faster than doing the whole motif, but you get the identical result. So this simple example, you end up with four rows because there are four symmetrically unique points. This is a this is actually ethane uh, 01 from the CSD. Um, and the collapsing of rows should happen where there are symmetries. Actually, I don't think there are any instances in the CSD where where uh, rows do collapse because we use the asymmetric unit already. Uh, if rows collapse and I look at the structure, usually there's a symmetry there. So, um, so we uh, have, yeah, not quite much. Let's, let's, let's do the last slide. And so the last step is to lexicograph lexicographically order these rows. This semi-important and semi-unimportant you know, go to the next slide yeah. um, this ensures that um, we have invariance actually because if I reorder my points then it would reorder the order of the rows so technically um, reordering the points would give me unequal distributions because we use earth moves distance which we'll get onto in a sec they, the distance between them would still be zero but but because of our mathematical requirement, we want equal. We, we just apply this arbitrary ordering and it sort of stabilizes everything. That means you, so to, to compare, to decide which row goes first, um, you compare the first two elements. If they're the same, move on to the next. If they're the same, move on to the next. And the first time you get a different um, value, you put the smaller one on top. So we swap around these rows sort of um uh, as in a dictionary it's first letter first and second letter then first uh, if everything's identical then they would have been collapsed in the in the step before uh yeah 
and we compare these with earth movement distance. So on the left, I've got e shane 01 from before. On the right, I've got a completely made up thing that I just took the, the middle module rotating it around. Um, but the earth movers distance is the appropriate way to compare these. Because if you think about, uh, say, the example from earlier, where I extend the unit cell and put her points, all of a sudden we're going to have like um, one PDD with um, fewer rows than another. And we need some way to compare these distributions where. Um, the rows might be in different orders and there might be more or less in one or the other. Um, and this is the result for continuity in terms of this thing called bottleneck distance. Bottleneck distance is um, basically it's the minimum, what is it, the minimum over, overall bijections between two uh, periodic sets. It uh, minimizes the maximum distance you have to move a point, something like that. It's a, a very sensible a way to to have a metric between two periodic sets but is computationally intractable so we don't we don't really want to use it we want to have a, an inequality around it and we want to use that this distance on these things um so for people who don't know how earth movers distance works it's a matching algorithm so in this case we have four rows on top and four on bottom but it wouldn't have to be and all the weights are equal but it doesn't have to be either and basically, Earth movers distance finds an optimal matching from the top set of rows, the top rows to the bottom rows, and it has to respect these weights as well. And um, essentially, this is the appropriate metric such that you get continuity out of out of um, these pointwise distance distributions. You need something that's immune to having the rows flipped around because because perturbing points slightly could mean that. The first value uh, changes ever so slightly in, in 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 a column, and that means two rows swap around. So you need something that's not going to be bothered by that. Some some magnitude difference, or some square. Ah, um, the distance between two rows. Uh, we use uh, L infinity, which is the maximum distance between any two values. Maximum difference. So you could just imagine taking the first row of the top one and the first row of the second one, just uh, minus the one from the other and take the absolute value and the maximum of all those. But you can actually choose any metric. You get a different earth movers distance for any metric you choose between rows. Um, but we tend to choose a simple one and it works pretty well. Because... Biggest, biggest deviation. Yeah. This, uh... And then you're doing the kind of the absolutely you you get a metric you get a different earth movers distance um for each metric you choose you basically first compute a distance matrix between rows in one and rows in the other and um the distance in that distance matrix could be anything in practice we use l infinity but you can use l2 if you really like to um, and then i i think you might have explained it like the weight or the weight. Ah, um, so the weights are basically uh, there because. So it's, this sort of was touched on yesterday, but if you have, um, let's say we have like a, uh, we'll just leave on this right here, a symmetrically perfect ethane atom, the three hydrogens around the carbon are all symmetrically identical, but there are, there are three times as many. Um, so. You would have, have two rows, but one would have weight 0.25, the other would have weight 0.75. The weights are respected in the sense that, um, so here the weights are all equal, so it's a simple example. But basically, if we had a weight of 0.5, that would have to line up with um, a total of weight 0.5 in the other, in the other uh, um, um, PDD. I don't think I'm explaining it very well. Actually. Then could it help? Yeah, so sure. when we double a unit cell, our motif becomes twice larger. But the weights take care of the situation because uh, initially the PDD matrix has twice as many rows, but we collapse identical rows and assign weights. Yeah, yeah. So that's why we doubling. Well, just to understand. So you've got 
Each of these we would call a partial deviation. Okay. So your matrix, so the language we use is that's a partial deviation. And then the total PDF is the way you sum the partial PDF. Mm -hmm. And you can, so partial PDF is where you select an app and put it in the origin and choose the PDF with respect to that. Ah, atom wise. Yeah, atom wise. Mm -hmm. Um, if you have symmetry equivalent atoms, they'll generate the same thing. Mm -hmm. So you can reduce, you can line reduce, mm -hmm. but you would give a, a multiplicity of two in some sense there, but then I think you two or half. Like you're so yeah, it's an a half, I think. Yeah. Yeah. The number of, so the so number of, so the number of yeah, so, mm -hmm. so that captures the number of. Uh, Multiplicity. Yeah, yeah, the, the multiplicity yeah. the number of times by symmetry that that thing is generated. And then when we do practical experiments, the so scattering power of the atoms in the pair is different. Like if everything is carbon, everything is weighted the same, but if some if some partial PDFs are uh, yes, between carbon and sodium or something because sodium has a different number of electrons and carbon mm. that will contribute more to your scattering pattern so we have to factor that in as well but you probably don't if you're only concerned with geometry it's true we, 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 i wouldn't say we're only concerned with geometry what we like is that we reduce it to geometry only and now we can stick extra things like atomic labels on top of it if you yeah. need it yeah but the, but because we've reduced it to just geometry we've got this very well defined problem on an equivalent and equivalence classes and things like that yeah. um, um you you sort of get a lot of mathematical guarantees and then if, if I, I, i'm uh, slightly embarrassed i have never heard of a partial pdf yeah um, i know pdf I, I really should know about that given yeah. that it's so close to our wheelhouse but yeah, so I mean, when we talk about PDF, we typically measure this uh, one dimensional function. And if you think of a thing which has got A and B atoms in it, um, it would include C partials, which would be the AA partial, the AB partial, the ABC partial. But um, in general, we split it by the atomic type like that, but actually, really, you could generate the total PDF as the sum. Total PDF is we put an atom at the origin, and then we give it a histogram of neighbors, basically. Distances to neighbors. Distances to neighbors, yeah. So you make the, you have a distance axis, and then you just hang a histogram of this. Yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah. Radial, radial. Yeah, I yeah. Thought, did you yeah. mean RDF or PDF? So all of these are basically related by kind of deterministic uh, geometric correction. So you can get a bunch of histologers in a row. Actually, not histologers, they don't really think this way, but you kind of PDF people and they'll be like arguing until midnight about G of R, G of R, G of R. <laughs> Radial distribution. Well, isn't it true that G of R is um, unique? Uh, but, but it's a unique uh, the property of the crystal. So what is G of R? The, the, the radial distribution. Radial distribution. Uh, would be uh, a unique. It's like an invariant. Do, do you mean complete or only invariant? It was. I, 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 I seem to remember. It's not a friend of mine telling me that it was you proved that it was and I can probably check it but I mean not the crystal very very it's not yeah, so yeah, construct yeah. you're saying you can construct uh, you can construct two different crystals that have the, the same G of R. Yeah. 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 Um, <laughs> No, but the diff so we talk about peak, you know, you said radio distribution function, but I mean, we can, so what we typically use is this package V of R, 
which is four pi r root naught times rho of r, and rho of r is like q bar divided by r squared to the zero. So I mean, right. uh, there's just these kind of geometric corrections that take one to the other, and there's different reasons being different. Different but all of the things of that same all of those, all of those functional, those uh, functional descriptors. Mm. Yeah. Um, yeah. 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 So I don't know if I mean I guess nobody's bothered to look into completeness of those of um, of, of those descriptors. We have a, a result, at least generic completeness result, which is quite nice. Um, and maybe some of that uh, that geometric correction thing we will get onto in a little bit in the, in the same vein here as you would there. Yeah. But I, I guess I'm not really trying to go down that rabbit hole point. I, I, I think after this, we have a discussion of open problems. Yeah. Every so, so maybe. Uh, but the language, the language that we use is you, you always do these, these double sums, right? Or you do, you know, you do a sum over neighbors. Um, and then to get the total PDF, you do double sum. So you do a sum up to sum k neighbors for each atom and then you would sum those uh, uh, simply with sum so yeah. not a collection but yeah sum. so i mean our total pdf would just be the column wise sum of your mm -hmm. or so it's not, really, not really summing <laughs> what you're doing is you're putting distances and that is the put your can we go to the next slide because yeah, sure. it's relevant yeah. Eh? yeah yeah um instead of i mean i guess it's not sum it's a it's a sum and then you divide here but if you if you take this average over the columns, a weighted average, um, then you then you get this description. So I guess that sum, if you multiply this by the right number, then you would get the sum that you were just discussing. Right? And this is now a vector. It has the same. This is like what's the MD then? So this is um we we just dis dis introduced this PDD, which is its own dis uh, invariant. Yeah. You take this average, you get another invariant. But oh, this okay. one's a vector instead of a matrix. And it's much faster to compare these guys and it's got the same sort of properties not the uh, same completeness properties let's say but um continuity invariance um and actually we're going to be talking mm, about amds yeah. from now not pdd so so that thing is actually invariant mm, both of them uh, oh yeah i mean that one it's, not really it's um basically the average distance to case neighbor yeah. over a unit cell so, um, so, Simon, do you think that with AMD sequence of vector can, can be in, well, up to renormalization can be equivalent to PDF or RDF? That's nothing the same, is it? Um, if I have if I have a big ball and a small ball. And the small ball is less than half the band of the big ball. Then I can my small ball can have like two neighbors, two small neighbors before it gets to one neighbor of the big neighbor, right? So I mean, what I'm doing is I'm making I'm getting my partial PDF with respect to the big ball, partial PDF with respect to the small ball, and measuring distances, and then I'm just making columns which contain those numbers, right? And now when you're averaging, you could very well be averaging the third neighbor of my of my uh, you know my my third neighbor, like my the third neighbor of my small ball could have the same numbers as the first neighbor of my big ball. So very roughly speaking, we could have lots of information here. Yeah, so you're, you're it's doing, true, but in practice it tends to do pretty well. So yeah. mathematically you know what you're doing is perfectly well defined but in terms of structure it's a very strange yes so it's uh, for example the first amd value is for average um, bond distance because uh, we are measuring the distance to the first nearest neighbor yeah then to the second nearest neighbor yeah. and uh, so we have actually started from this invariant and only after what explored pdd because yeah. amd is simpler uh, simpler to compute and sure. simpler to compare more importantly yeah 
and in all real comparisons we first compare by AMD average minimum distance and only after that uh, by PDD. Uh, yeah. Uh, yeah, it's true. You could we could in theory lose like information here, but um, but the AMD tends to be quite quite well distinguishing. But we'll see that um, that the way it kind of the way that it how big uh, like in terms of complexity. Um, mm -hmm. So, um, how much, what are we talking about here? Like, you have a win, right? It is, I mean, principally, it's large as you want, right? You have quantity that you want. Right? But, but what I'm asking is, so what do you have in mind? What's your target? You know, the number of neighbors, K? The number of neighbors, and you know, the number of, I think there's some sort of an information measure for the complexity of the human cell that just you could actually define the how complex, like in terms of how many atoms would be minimal to mm. describe that. Right. So we have. That must be an endurance thing, right? It's a sort of minimum description. So the smallest unit cell you can use. Yeah, the number of atoms in a primitive unit cell. Sorry? The number of atoms in a primitive unit cell. Yeah, that's it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So how, how many. So if you have M, then the PDD matrix will have at most M rows. But what sort of numbers do you envision? Well, any. Any. Yeah. How big they get in practice, maybe? Ooh. It's probably a stupid question. No, I think there's, there's, there's a few motifs out there with thousands of points in them. Yeah. 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 That's, yeah. that's what I had. Yeah, yeah. They, they, they are out there. Yeah. I mean, if it was only like 20, then no, 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 well, maybe no. I could do a stupid. So we, we did it for the whole Cambridge structural database yeah. mm. using only 100 neighbors, actually. Okay. I've seen there's a lot of now with the like the network and balls and balls. I think RAV, RAV, XOD, something like that has a four of like 70 amps, which is something stupid. I mean, it doesn't, I don't even know for real, but anyway, yeah, um, let's, uh, let's, Let's we may skip some slides. I'm not sure. Uh, um, okay. Um yeah, should we should we should we maybe skip this slide? Do you have any questions on generic completeness? Because but, yeah. this slide has more details than my version. Um, I don't I don't really expect you all to read these things, but yes. basically they're conditions that allow you to, to reconstruct um, your crystal from the computing to these things. And they ask that things don't fall perfect right angles and there are no basically you, you can imagine that if you have three distances like we were mentioning yesterday with a triangle you can reconstruct a triangle from those three distances by starting with a point in the middle and then drawing a circle around it and drawing more circles and where they intersect as a point with all this collection of distances you can do a similar thing but you have to have some assumption so we get not full but but partial sort of i say i don't want to use the word partial actually because generic is a good term Basically, the collection of crystals that fail this are of measure zero, right? Um, if you if you have a so-called bad crystal that doesn't satisfy these, almost any perturbation will make it um, generic. Um, is there a point that there are any plus one spins in the middle of the It is actually n plus one. Oh, oh, oh yeah, sorry. That's um no, no, that is that is that is good. Yeah, correct, that's correct. Right. That's right. Yeah. Oh, I see. That's it. Yeah. yeah. In three dimensions, we need four spheres. Oh, so I was reading really, as n plus one dash sphere, like there's a. But okay. Um. So, just very quickly to wrap it through, I'm not going to talk too much about what's on the right there. It's a map without meaningful coordinates, but we're going to get onto maps with meaningful coordinates soon. So it's very good at detecting uh, geometrically identical structures. Um, it's quite robust in the sense that you can replace the three with actually did this with a molecule where two molecules kind of look similar if you squint your eyes but they're not you can imagine that that really confuses our descriptor because all the distances change but if you replace the molecules with the sensors you, you yield back kind of nice results and it's, it works nicely for finite sets as well um i'll skip this because i think we, we did it yesterday but i think pdf doesn't oh so the, the collection of distances between all points on the left here is the same for both, but PDD distinguishes them, which is quite nice. 
And this was kind of a nice result. So we looked through the CSD and compared everything against everything else with these and managed to um, find five uh, entries where we have literal identical geometry, but one atom has been switched for a different element of a different uh, right. So this really couldn't happen. Vitaly said yesterday actually that if you get the sips up of these things, they're identical coordinate for coordinate. That's true for four of them, but not actually for this pair. For this pair, the, the list of coordinates is different, but when you pack everything, you can see that they are geometrically identical. So, I mean, I don't even know how that happens. Someone applied transformation, presumably, to one to get the other, because it's no coincidence, right? I've been told it's um, rude to, to, to accuse anyone of anything, but uh, there's basically no other way that this could happen other than a mistake or someone doing it on purpose. Our colleagues in the Cambridge uh, crystallographic data centers uh, could check that for this duplicates even structure factors were identical. So not only coordinates, but we had investigated, but even deeper information. Um, so I'll briefly introduce this because it appears in our maps. So we can actually get a, um, a, a, a result on how this AMD and the PDD behaves as A gets really big. It becomes a cube root in three dimensions and, and M through in N dimensions. So um, that formula there is, is what the AMD eventually approaches. And it's in the form of a constant times root K. This is a vast generalization of the Gauss circle problem. Um, and you can probably derive that little formula up there yourself in five minutes if you think about it just a little bit. Um, basically, a big sphere contains lots of unit cells and you can count them once. And, and, uh, uh, yeah. um, I mentioned this because I'm going to define this thing that are now for now called AMD deviation, which is just how much the AMD is away from this sort of expected value. I call it expected value. That's a bad bit, thing to use in the presence of mathematicians because it's, it's not probabilistic whatsoever. It's just this kind of baseline. It's what it converges to eventually. But AMD will kind of wiggle around that expected value, if you like. And uh, the AMD tends to be composed of two bits, right? It's got this converges based on the density, but it wiggles around that convergent curve based on the shape of the structure. So here's um, the map, uh, A map. We'll start with A map uh, of the CSD, which has axes everyone's familiar with. So on the X is uh, just physical density and on the Y is point density. So as you might expect, they're not unrelated, but they're not completely related. You've got this dark spot where everything likes to live. That's a theme in these maps. That's your typical CSD structure, some sort of organic thing, um, lots and lots of carbon, maybe a few more fancy atoms in there, many uh, benzene and stuff. And then, density number Yes. Um, and then, so it's, this smudge to the right is basically heavier stuff and heavier stuff to the right, right? Because. Point in that case, the front yeah, so on, so on the bottom, the although we've ignored. Atom, take every atom, then take a structure, you turn into a point cloud. Yeah. Then well, you we, analyze the geometry of the point cloud. Yeah. We have actually removed labels uh, and these atomic types for everything yeah. so far. Yeah. This x axis with physical density is the only time I've actually reintroduced those elements. Yeah. Um, but um, you can kind of figure out why there's a spread to the right because heavy atoms will be interpreted the same for point density, but are much heavier for physical density. So you can go to the right. We've got this really sharp line, which I, I've looked there, and it's like um, so on, on this line is loads and loads of carbon. Just to the right of the line is lots of carbon, but also other bits like a typical organic thing. But then on the line is mostly just carbon or a lot of things that are a little bit lighter than carbon. So you've only got helium, uh, what is it, lithium and beryllium and boron. Um, that tiny little smudge which just jumps over the line to the left is stuff that's full of boron. Boron's basically the only popular thing, it seems, um, that's lighter than carbon. Um, and it can kind of push just a little bit to the left of this main line. But the carbon is the thing that dominates everything. No, uh, so, so I hope everyone understands like this map because now we've got maps with R invariants on it. We can kind of interpret these. So on the x-axis, we've got the first AMD, the average to the first nearest neighbor. And on the y, we've got the distance to the second nearest neighbor average. 
um, I've drawn it so the axes are equal. So this 45 degree angle is you can't live below that because your second neighbor has to be at least further away than your first. Um, things don't type, tend to like to live near the line. They, uh, they, they, they sort of like to live again in this dark spot. That's a very typical CS module. Uh, CS, yeah, CS, CS, CS module. Sure. Um, and then you get this kind of smudge. And so, so the upright smudge is where you'll see all these heavy sort of metal things. But there's a distinct sort of gap between a smudge on the left there and a smudge on the right. And that's not actually a coincidence. So it turns out that um, this, this blob on the left, which is distinct, right above, directly above the uh, dark spot, right, and not to the right of it, um, are things called metal carbonyls or metal carbonyls or whatever. Um, and this happens because of these uh, oxygens, which are double or sometimes triple bonded to the carbons, uh, like a, a terminus. So the oxygen's first nearest neighbor is very close. That's a short bond distance, like 1.1 angstroms, making the first nearest neighbor small. So that's that's pushing it sort of to the left of, uh, on, on the x axis, right? But then the second nearest neighbor to the oxygen is quite far away. You have to go quite far to get to the second one in comparison to the first nearest. So these metal carbonyls have um, a small first nearest neighbor distance on average, but quite high second. Whereas um, if you like big atoms, small atoms, big atoms, small atoms. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Big atoms, small atoms. I mean, so, light so, heavy. Light atoms, heavy atoms. Big atoms, small atoms. Okay. Geometric. Yeah, I mean, just think of the atoms just balls, right? If you imagine the difference, you can try and think about how it's good. And you have, you have, you know, so you're looking at first versus second neighbor, right? And they're all, all, above, all balls are going to be the same size. They're all points, by the way. We don't yeah. actually model them as balls. No, no, but they're, 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 they're hard spheres. So you're taking your points at the center of hard spheres that are trying to find space. Oh, well, yeah, yeah. Right, it's one way to think about it. Yeah. And so, obviously, your second neighbor can't be closer than your first neighbor. But what's going to happen is that the second neighbor, if you're trying to pack balls, the second neighbor is going to be some geometric, something like the two times your first neighbor distance, right? And so your, Maybe, main, yeah. your main thing is going to be above that cutoff, but it's going to be tilted over. It's going to go like in two, something like that. So if most of your structures are mostly made from the same size foils, then we might see something like this. Right? Well, we see in the hexagonal lattice in a simple case, uh, the first uh, distance AMD is exactly the same as AMD2, AMD3, because you have many neighbors that at roughly the same distances, at exactly the same distances in hexagonal lattice. The first six distances are the same in hexagonal lattice. Uh, yeah, in a lattice, hexagonal lattice, yeah. Yes. In hexagonal lattice, we have six neighbors yeah. of, of every atom at exactly the same distances. So they will be right on the diagonal. Uh, but, well, in general, for, my, for molecular organic crystals, of course, let's uh, not the case. So AMD2 will be sometimes uh, sometimes very close to AMD1, sometimes uh, larger. So that's why we, we have this map, maps and the variation. When I thought that you collapse, if you have six neighbors that are the same, then you collapse that row. Mm -hmm. no, they collapse in one row, right? This is one row per, per atom. So you have six like pieces in one row. So collapsing is between atoms, not between neighbors. Yeah. So um, yeah. Okay. So that thing in your so that thing in your PPD is not the partial. Well, I mean, it encodes the partial for it. Immediately after this, I'm going to look up what that is. Right. So in crystallography again, if you talk about neighbor, you have the first neighbor and the second neighbor. You would count all six of those as being the first neighbor. Ah, and the second neighbor would be the next shell. Right. 
uh, but long there is a problem with continuity because uh, with six uh, exact neighbors could could become different and the perturbation uh, yeah, like it's like a yeah that's that's why there is a, there is extra smoothing uh, on the pdf and we instead of this extra smoothing apply a smoother distance to get a continuous metric so we don't use any uh, any smoothing we keep uh, the invariant uh, consisting of discrete values yeah yeah so uh, I'm starting to overrun, but I, I wouldn't really like to get to the last slide. So, so um, here, I've somewhat arbitrarily chosen these axes. It doesn't matter so much, but I just want to point out some some sort of uh, popular structures on here. The dark spots are popular structures. And um, I think some of the clouds are a little faint. So on the next slide where I circle stuff and point at stuff, I've, I've changed the, um, the, the color scale, but it's the same map, right? Hopefully you can kind of see these smudges. So oxalic acid, which we saw yesterday, is hugely popular and put, makes this little dark spot, which is very visible on basically every single map you draw. This is the amount it's moving around its um, its baseline that we introduced earlier. But um, oh. maybe it's a little difficult. To, to, but basically, this is talking about 50th nearest neighbor versus 100th nearest neighbor. So the deviation was something. So A, so A and B has some kind of well-defined essence property. Yeah. Yeah. Right? yeah. And then we look at an actual structure and see how far it's away from. Yeah. Yes. So something like a moth, moth five is, I guess, the most popular moth because it's the biggest blob I can see, and it tends to like to live far away from the cloud, like the main, the main spot, because this main spot is a uh, really common stuff with, with generally not so many big voids. But things like moths with voids tend to live a bit further out. Partial structures live like really far away from here because of the huge voids there. Um, and then sort of realistic structures in the smudge to the to the left. But maybe you recognize some of these. Um, if you squint your eyes, they're all uh, they're all visibly like uh, more popular than the stuff around. Them. But um, so so the next slide is the exact same map but for the crystallography open database which i expected to look identical to the csd but actually does not so um maybe i won't get too much time but we can explain these lines these lines all point to the origin and they imply that your distances to neighbors are like kind of all proportional to each other it turns out that these are all um highly symmetric cubic only and a specific kind of cubic crystal. This might only, this, this category of cubic might be just because that's the most popular one. I actually don't know, but I looked on these lines and they all tend to correspond to their own like little space groups. Um, and it's because they're super, um, these tend to have one, two, maybe three atoms in an asymmetric unit and all the distances are like all just proportional to each other, right? I think we maybe mentioned this earlier. So that kind of explains that. Small organics, then, as well as so, say again, small organics. Yeah, so I lied when I said that. Well, I didn't lie. I mean, I, I expected the same thing as um, the CSD, but I forgot that the ICSD and the CSD are different things. Yeah. The things that are in these lines are in the ICSD, not the CSD. If you yeah. plot the ICSD, they reappear. Yeah, so, um, yeah. Um, if you want to try uh, AMD, then uh, go for it. It's easily installable and all that. It's, should be pretty easy to use. There's um, the current record time that I have for computing uh, AMD for the, for the whole CSD, which is a pretty good time, but that's one thread. I mean, if you have a better computer than me, it'll be faster. And if you want to use as many cores as you want, divide that time by as many cores as you've got. And um, it's, you know, pretty fast. Um, and I, I, that we'll, we'll leave it there because we're, we're over it. Okay, thank you very much, Dan. Well, thank you. I'll uh, I'll stop the recording.